first of all, thank you for being here. Um, and I'll give my background here a little bit. My name is uh, Pierre Du Bois, um, founder of Zamana Analytics, and I am a Gary, Indiana native. I'm actually speaking to you right now from Gary, Indiana. Uh, but I've moved around quite a bit uh, during my time, and I founded Zamana back in 2009 uh, while I was in Brooklyn. Uh, my prior life, I was an engineer at Ford Motor Company. So if you go back and find an old Ford Ranger, an old Ford Explorer, um, if you find a trailer hitch, I was the engineer that was responsible for that, and as well as expert certification for Explorer. Um, as Sia mentioned, I have been writing on analytics for almost the entire 13 years uh, that Zamana has existed. And it's kind of been an accidental thing. Um, it was started with um, allanalytics.com, which folded now, I think about now it's been almost two years. Uh, DM News, I, I've written for them. Um, and I've also uh, I've appeared in the Chicago Sun Times. And I am currently a contributor to. CMS Wire, I've been contributing to them since their initial launch now almost, I gotta go back and think about this, eight years ago, almost. So so I've been around for a little bit. Um, and, I, and I wanna get more into, um, I, I wanted to make this a, a kind of a casual presentation of all sorts, basically. So, so it's not gonna be very, very, very technical. Um, so a lot of, um, uh, a lot of times uh, being online, uh, what made me think about this was, not only my experiences, but also what I see from other professionals, particularly other Black professionals as well. Um, and so this is going to be a little bit of a mix of content, um, a little bit of talking about, um, and by content, what I mean is about, you know, what organ organizing you need to do uh, behind the scenes. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that quite a bit. Um, and you want to do it in such a way that you can present your expertise um, and, and complement whatever portfolio you have on tech. I use the word tech here because some of these tips can really work if you are just a um, if you're working with data maybe with R programming, or uh, maybe working with data through um, maybe a platform like um, Tableau or uh, Power BI, or maybe you're just doing it's if you're a developer maybe some just straight programming. Uh, I know there's some people who Python who are dedicated to that. That's fine. E either way, these things can help you a little bit along the way in terms of organizing it. That's kind of how we're going to approach this this evening. Um, on top of that, I mentioned about entrepreneurial um, and a little bit about freelance perspectives. And the reason why I bring those in is because um, I've learned a lot from a lot of people um, over the years. And one of the things that's important is trying to figure out you know, what to do, what not to do, and how to communicate online a little bit, what to emphasize. And then finally, we'll mention some solutions on here. These are not comprehensive, but it'll kind of give you a starting point. Um, it's Again, this is not going to be very tech heavy. We'll mention a little bit about, about GitHub, a little bit about notebooks, for example, but it won't be very heavy on that. This is going to be mostly a little bit about um, kind of organizing your um, uh, things around your content, how you manage your, your uh, professional things around your content such that it gives a professional image for what you want to do and what you want to get accomplished and how it can complement you as you are doing presentations on your own. Um, so why is being professional online important? Um, well, there's some things that are obvious and not so obvious. Um, for starters, um, the biggest one probably and the most obvious one it has to do with the pandemic. Uh, people have been networking online uh, much more robustly uh, since the pandemic has started. And I know that many people are, are kind of weary and zoomed out, but never, nonetheless, uh, folks have learned how to connect with each other online. Uh, and that leads to a couple of, of big phenomenons. I think some of this is also cultural for us um, as, as Black professionals. For starters, um, allies are not always nearby. And what I mean by this is that sometimes the people who can make really critical recommendations or really critical support um, are not necessarily in the room and may not even be within the vicinity for what you're trying to do. Um, I'll, a, a real quick example, I have a, uh, I was a big brother, a big sister in Detroit, and my little, um, who's now no longer little, um, is trying to get a couple of things done um, uh, in Detroit, and I'm trying to help him from remote from my laptop. So that's a great example. Um, and I can tell you from personal experience, the people who've supported me for grad school for recommendations, they were, you know, they reached out, and this was way before, way, way, way before we were here with, with um, uh, working remote. So, ally, you need to do things to kind of cultivate those allies a little bit. That's that's the ma major point. 
Um, building your communities online, um, they're much more highly active now than what they used to be. Um, I mentioned about meetups. Um, I mentioned about Twitter hashtags, Twitter spaces. I know that many of you probably have dealt with Twitter spaces at some level. Um, that has elevated Twitter spaces and Clubhouse to some degree. I've, I've seen more Twitter spaces than anything else. Um, they've elevated the uh, ability for communities to kind of marshal, get together, and talk to each other without necessarily being in the room. Um, and then all this leads to um, content that needs to be related to your work. Um, and a lot of times you, you're going to have a lot of choices in how to present that content. And that content can be quickly displayed online. Um, it could be a great way of, of starting a conversation, getting a conversation going. Um, so again, that's why it's important. So while it's, while it's important, um, the next question becomes, you know, is it easy to do? Well, not necessarily. There, online reputations can be a little bit challenging to maintain. And a lot of this has to deal with um, um, just the idea of being online that a lot of things are not as visible as we would like them to be. Your behind the scenes work is completely unseen. So what happens is, is that as you engage and talk to people, um, you find that if, that people have different skill sets, maybe different understandings of, uh, of um, um, programming, of syntax, of you know what the objectives are, what is it that you're trying to get accomplished. Um, even if you put something in a readme, <laughs> so, for all intents and purposes, that um, you know what that person takes away may not be exactly what you intended if you created a readme document. So, so it it so, so there's there's a little bit of murkiness behind it. So sometimes it's hard to see or understand what people are working with. And I can I can tell you from firsthand working with clients remote that that's always been a challenge. Another part of this has to do with the tools we have, and as you probably can imagine, um, it's very easy now to pick something and pick a lot of tasks that start kind of masking what it is that you're trying to do. It's I, I call it what about isms um, and, or what about ism tasks, basically. The idea that um, you have all these tasks and it starts becoming um, uh, uh, a you know, feel like you're going in circles trying to figure out, you know, are they really necessary or are they go plate, plate, plated tasks, things that should be, um, uh, that maybe are not necessarily as important as what we think they should be. So um, I'll, I'll, I'll give you some examples as we go along here. Um, the other thing is that your online audience is a little bit fragmented. And let me explain about this. Um, you social media has been around for a while. Um, we have different communities, different um, uh, people who participate and engage. And so a lot of times it's it's you need to be doing something dynamic to get to those right communities, whether it's support groups for what you're programming and building, or if you're trying to build a career in a particular industry, um, trying to network with people, you need to be doing some things to, to connect to those audiences. Um, Twitter, is a, Twitter has been a great platform um, for different subgroups and different uh, cohorts. But again, it's dynamic. You need to build into that. Um, and then online associations can shift. And here's what I mean by this. Groups do not last all the time. Sometimes they get defunct. Sometimes they go dead. Um, and then unfortunately, you can have even, um, and this, this is more the entrepreneurial pick of it, but you can even have people who are frauds who are trying to social engineer a relationship with you. In other words, you are, you may be legitimate um, in terms of skill and, and uh, uh, how you approach things, but sometimes people are not, sometimes people see some things in that and build, try to build off of that. Um, and that's, sometimes that's not a good thing. You want, you want to be able to have a clean, um, um, good relationships. And, and quite frankly, it's also hard to identify because some of the, um, Sometimes being the person who has not quite all the skills together is just incidental, not necessarily um, not necessarily something uh, nefarious. So it's so it's very hard to uh, pick out. So where should you start? Well, a great starting uh, point um, is with the projects you're trying to put together. And I'm pretty sure by now, if you if you've dealt with anything with R with Python. Um, um, or if anything with programming, most people are, are suggesting to you to try to work on a project. And you probably, if you haven't heard that already, that as a drumbeat does, that has gotten stronger, particularly in 2021, it will probably get even stronger in 2022. 
And your project can can um, not only be a place where your data resides with um, whatever programming you're doing, but it's also a way of maybe uh, collecting some notes as well too. And then, and let's get real. Sometimes we get interrupted when we're trying to work on projects. For example, on um, uh, for um, our studio, I, I, I did a screenshot here. This is something on TensorFlow that I'm trying to go back and learn on decision trees and. You know, one of the things I'm finding, there's two parts that, that I'm finding that's a little bit difficult is that I'm having one of the libraries not run correctly. So that's, you see that little red dot in the, in the lower corner. Um, and I, I put some notes together just to kind of, as a little reminder of what it was I was trying to get to. In fact, this day when I was working on it, I was not quite getting it done, basically. So a lot of times you, you block out the time for your projects and tasks, uh, which is supposed to be your deep work. And you need to gather something, that, at least even just a, something light in the notes that tell you, um, as a reminder, what is the objective? What is it that you're trying to do? That should be a good starting point, at least. Another backup that you want to think about is the notes that you take. Um, now, you know, for I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, note apps for a moment. Um, and what I mean by this are, are, are you may have heard of some of these as well. Evernote, which I am, I'm going to say this, I'm a big, big Evernote fanatic. Um, I could probably talk your ear off on Evernote. <laughs> so um, I may even come back and do a whole Evernote presentation, basically. But um, uh, things like Evernote, uh, Microsoft, I believe OneNote is theirs. And I believe Google Keep, if I'm doing this off the top of my head. Um, all these are different types of note-taking platforms, but one of the things that they're very good at is saving articles and placing them into folders or different uh, binders. And for, in the case of Evernote, which would be the crux of this uh, presentation, um, you can put notebooks together on different subjects, ranging on machine learning. It could be on regressions. It could be on Python. It could be on R. It could be on Google Analytics. It could be on uh, different frameworks of JavaScript. It could be on um, uh, maybe different parts of uh, GitHub. Um, and the best thing about Evernote is that you can set up what's called a central notebook. This is where... Um, you can kind of think of it as uh, just like your locker back in high school you used to throw things in the locker and, and move on. Um, it, it's a notebook that you can actually throw different articles, save them, and then maybe move them later on into a desired note into a desired notebook if you're not quite sure where they should go. But sometimes um, uh, when you're putting together projects and when you're putting together um, documents um, or researching documents, you may need to have something that can hold on to. Uh, place them into notebooks, basically, as, as a great um, uh, saver. So, let's see how we're doing here. 616. Okay, so I want to make sure I keep us on time and on track here. So, um, so another starting point also are, of course, whiteboards. And there's a lot of different ways you can do this. There's no one, one particular way. Um, a dry board, you can use a, a dry board in a library. Uh, the picture that you see here with this Evernote with the arrows, and I'm going to explain this a little bit. I actually, for a long time, kept a whiteboard, a very portable light whiteboard nearby me. Um, and the reason that you do this is because sometimes you may have ideas that are not necessarily sorted out, but you need something to, um, with a marker and a dry, and a dry eraser to go back and, and resort and relist and think through uh, how you want to organize. Um, Whiteboards are great for this. And there are some software that can help you with this. Um, Miro is the most, um, uh, probably the most uh, direct one in terms of being a uh, mind map or a, dry, or a very or online uh, whiteboard, so to speak. Um, and even if you do something on a, on a piece of paper, that's fine. Um, on the right-hand side is, a, is a, just a, a piece of paper I scribbled just as an example of what, what's called a mind map. Um, and a mind map, if you have not heard this before, is very simply a kind of a cloud that you put together where you have branches and each branch has different topics associated to that main topic in the center. And this is something that I'll be honest with you, the car companies have used this for years, uh, particularly when you're, when you're thinking about a customer persona and thinking about the activities that they would do. Um, car companies would used to do this all the time. They would sit down and they would they would do a mind map, but they actually would have images associated with that. So um, in this case, what I've done is I, I've taken the Corvette, 
Um, and I know that's not a Ford product, but bear with me. I love the Corvette ZL6. Um, so, um, and this, you can, and it doesn't have to be anything fancy. Each branch could be a particular topic, and there could be sub branches for it. So, like in this case, for a Corvette, you can have one branch that talks about vehicle financing and talking about what you should be doing to plan a finance for a Corvette. Uh, maybe another branch that talks about the history of the Corvette that it was built in St. Louis at one particular time, and and there's um, uh, different uh, generations that came before the current design of Corvette. Um, you can have an engineering branch uh, or design branch that talks about the actual design of the vehicle. Why did they switch from a front end to to a mid engine? And then finally, an engineering that gives you a um, list of uh, topics or things that are associated with how the vehicle was engineered. But the point of this is getting some sort of mind uh, map together is a great way of um, um, is a great way. Oop, let's go back. Is a great way of going back and thinking through um, uh, how to um, uh, get some ideas together and, and just get some broad ideas together. So with all these things um, um, put together, you start thinking about um, how you want to, um, um, things that you may want to convey online and things that will speak to how you want to elaborate on your skills and the time that you put in on it. Um, so what you want to do is think about maybe um, bite size or, or pieces of content that talks to things that you're, are, are of your interest. Um, Twitter, now each, we'll get into a little bit about this with, with mediums, but each medium is a little different. But the idea is, is that you want to think about um, explaining, you know, you know, what you've learned and why. If you're not sure how to do it in a very short framework, think about aiming for some, think about how, what it is that you want to talk about and think about maybe the first three sentences of what you've learned and why. And the reason that, that you think about this in that term is that it helps you to, it gives you a very good starting point that you can either build into which you can turn around and use maybe for um, in social media for Twitter or Instagram. It's maybe a description because when you do that in social media, you have a limited number of character count. Um, but it's it also could be a starting point when you later on, if you want to write a blog or write maybe a longer post, let's say in, in LinkedIn or, or maybe a blog post explaining something that may be a process, at least you have that kernel of an idea uh, I'd identified. And you can, again, put this into Evernote or some sort of a uh, um, note-taking app. Um, and the idea should help people understand, you know, what is it you've learned? Um, what is it, uh, how does, what does it mean against um, IRL, what is it in real life, basically? Or what's the business case for it? Um, it should be an idea that moves you away from something that's very, very general. Um, so for example, I mentioned about uh, a little bit about projects um, a general idea would be building projects are important. Well, what's what's important? Um, but a better idea, a better way of expressing that might be getting to what, what, why it's important. There's something specific. Building projects teaches how tasks are connected to your business ob ob objectives, basically. So the story of this is that you want to be able to start thinking about, you know, you did, you're doing some, um, you're gathering together some notes you're doing some brainstorming on those notes, which is, you know, again, you could use with a note app or maybe some sort of a whiteboard. And then you're trying to get to, what you should be coming out with is maybe some, maybe some short descriptions. Again, three sentences for ideas or things that you want to get into. Um, this example, this is not a great one, but it's actually a, a simple example. This was a screenshot of a post I put together for Instagram. And I use it to teach people a little bit about bits and pieces on anal anything that's analytics or anything on R programming. Um, R just introduced a new native pipe. So I put together a, a brief um, description and did a screenshot showing the pipe. Um, and I kept it to a couple of uh, sentences just to give an idea of um, what the person should be uh, looking for and why why this is important. So as you're trying to use different types of media, you'll find that each one um, gives you some ops, gives you a variation of options for how you communicate your professionalism. Um, I mentioned a little bit about, um, once you get all your, your ideas together, um, I mentioned a little bit about, about social media and I also mentioned a little bit about blogs and I'll talk a little bit about video as well here too and live chats. So we have a number of options, but each one has a different type of impact and you have to kind of keep that in mind 
um, as you're trying to express ideas or thoughts related to your background. Articles, for example, and there's a lot of ways you can do this. Um, articles are lets the reader apply some sort of step-by-step -step comprehension of what you're doing. So they're really great if you're trying to, again, explain um, uh, how to use uh, TensorFlow for a customer for a mo for modeling customer churn, for example, um, and you have a number of steps you want to explain to them. Um, video has a particular advantage in that you could probably do the same type of thing, but the difference is is that with video, you they, it can you can demonstrate what to expect from running a program or adding a dependency. Um, that can help people a little bit not only spark their imagination, but show them literally. Um, you'll find that much more important with uh, business contacts as well. Um, I'll, I'll explain why as we move forward. Um, and then some of the newest things that are going on are coming in from podcasts and live chats. So these are the uh, Twitter spaces, Clubhouse, um, Spotify green rooms of the world and so forth. Um, audio is a big deal um, and there's a lot of advantages to it. It's easier. Um, I had somebody said perfectly that um, he, he described Clubhouse as being basically like AM radio. It's just it's great to listen to ideas um, and listen to what people are doing. And what and the benefits from these things is that it's a, sometimes you get they're in groups, so you get the shared perspective of ideas um, stated maybe in a different way. So you get to learn a little bit from other people. Um, you know, may, they may have a different example. I use a lot of automotive at my end because that's something in my background. But you learn. Um, you might go to some go to a chat room and listen to somebody who worked in a restaurant or in the um, in the restaurant industry, or um, somebody who may have worked in um, uh, hotels um, in the hotel industry, and they may have a different aspect on how to use. Um, programming languages, how to do data models, um, and maybe a different, maybe even slightly or industry specific wording that might help spark or help you learn how or why those models are important. So there's kind of a, there's a back and forth benefit. And you want to, you want to, want to take advantage of that as well as um, uh, leverage that when you speak about um, your topics or your ideas. So um, and so each media, um, you have to identify the media that you would like to use. And there's um, there's no one wrong or right way of doing this. It's just a lot of different variations and nuances of it. Um, for articles, for example, um, you could be using Medium. I've actually started to use Medium a little bit more over the last year. Um, Medium's a great platform because you have a lot of people who come over from Twitter, a lot of people who come over from different social media um, and discover you. Um, uh, and Substack, Substack is also another a complimentary one as well, too. Um, but there's also some benefit for blogging on your own site as well. There's an SEO benefit for that. Um, from search engine optimization, if your blog is um, a subdirectory of your main website, um, so if, that, if you have it that set up in that way, then each time that you're writing an article or updating, you're kind of generating some SEO um, benefit for the site. Uh, Google looks for that, um, and Bing actually uh, looks for the uh, blogs or content that's updated uh, frequently. So, whereas with Medium, you actually are writing, but you're writing at, at a site separate from your website, obviously. So, there's some, depending on what you want to do, there's some benefit. Um, you know, you, projects is relatively new, and this is, and and I mentioned Git, GitHub, um, and I'll mention GitHub a little bit later. They actually introduced a uh, GitHub projects um, beta. Um, which is very similar to Notion for some reason in terms of how they use it, and as far as what I can tell. Um, but the point of it is, is that you have these different um, software or uh, different um, platforms that allow you to um, put together uh, your tasks, group them, and organize them. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit. Um, video is you, is put together in, in two different ways. You have video shorts, which you can use to feature highlights. Um, and these are the TikToks, basically, the TikToks, YouTube shorts, um, anything that's under a, a 30, even a, a two minute window, basically, where you can explain maybe, uh, again, an R pipe, for example. Uh, you may not explain TensorFlow, but you may explain uh, piping, basically. And then the long videos are, again, could be for education projects, uh, teaching people uh, different variations and steps. Um, um, and then you have podcasts 
where uh, people can can learn about what you do um, and also even can participate in groups, uh, which is also pretty powerful and very helpful if you are uh, just starting out and you're trying to join in with other other groups of people who are talking about maybe different aspects of Python, maybe different aspects of um, uh, of uh, machine learning, um, you know, different, you know, joining in with groups can help a little bit in terms of a uh, of um of uh, planning for content and thinking about um what you what you'd like to talk about so with all these in mind so now we we've talked about um kind of did some brainstorming talked about uh different uh sources and content let's talk a little bit about um i mentioned earlier way way earlier about the idea that your work is uh sometimes hidden <laughs> so it makes it hard for people to kind of see um that's okay but you want to be able to have some things that will help you get some things done quickly and 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 be able to uh, uh, turn around with within a relatively good time frame and make it easy for you. Um, one of the things I found that has been super helpful for me in the last, particularly now in the last two years, has been dictation. This has been growing in the last um, really about almost two. It's been there for a while, but it's been, the last couple of years, it's been, they've been growing much more uh, capable. Um, dictation is a feature that you have. You have it in, in just about every mobile phone. Um, Microsoft Word has it built in. I actually dictate from my into my laptop. Um, Evernote has this, but they did a change that I'm really kind of, quite frankly, a little you know shaking my fist at. Um, kind of almost like the old man get off your yard thing. Um, you can dictate, but it's only like a 30 second, like some weird 30 second or one minute window. And I'm not sure why they did that because at the very beginning, um, at, there were iterations where you could just dictate and which is, you just dictate to your heart's content. But in Evernote, you can still do that, but there's sort of a stopping mechanism where you have to stop and restart it again, basically. And then there's a website called dictation.io, separate from all this that you can actually dictate to. And so what you want to do is, if you're doing anything with written content or even just getting the ideas and you want to digitize it, um, what you want to do is just, just, you know, again, click the dictation and just let it be a stream of conscious, consciousness, get it out onto the page. Uh, what that does is that it speeds up, if you're doing articles or blogs, it speeds up the creation time um, by getting the initial thoughts down and then you can refine those thoughts. Um, I found that for any articles, um, for presentations, for, um, ideas, it was easier for me to just get it out and get over, you know, um, uh, even if you have imposter syndrome, I think that's this is helpful because if you get those ideas out, you can then focus on refining the details and refining those details can help you in planning out, you know, hey, this might be better as an article. This this section might be something I could tease out as for social media. Uh, this might be a section I can tease out for um, um, maybe a video, basically. Um, but it gives you more time to refine those details and not get too bogged down, basically. Oh, wow, 6.30. Okay. Um, so I'm going to keep us going here, basically. So um, getting back to Note apps, um, one of the things you can do with Evernote uh, in particular, and I don't know if OneNote and Google Keep has this, but I'm pretty sure they have something similar, is they, Evernote has a really good search feature. And I think this is important if you do a lot of research behind um, articles or things that you're doing. I'm not saying you can't Google something. It's just that I think the challenge is that um, with Evernote, if you have white papers in particular or any sort of documents, it will search in the PDF as well as return back any notes that you have dictated out or written out, basically. Um, so it's useful to kind of surface a lot of material. I have about maybe 9,000 notes in my Evernote right now as I speak. Um, so a lot of times what I'm doing is going back and looking and, and, and seeing and making comparisons between maybe articles that other people have written, white papers that people have written, and then on top of that, maybe notes I've had from something earlier that maybe I maybe have abandoned. And sometimes it helps me, and um, I'll say this when I write, I usually do a lot of writing. Um, a lot of times it's helped me to go back and quickly find um, ideas and try to make sure that um, and vet those ideas. Um, the other thing you want to keep in mind is that sometimes um, uh, techniques or frameworks uh, are go out of uh, date. Um, and I think with Google, while you, I think a Google search is still useful, I still think the other problem that you run into is that sometimes you're, you're betting on people updating things quickly, and sometimes that doesn't happen. 
Um, so sometimes you need to have something that can kind of narrow down the search a little bit for you uh, to make it easier. And that's getting things imported into a note app helps you to do that. Now, um, another thing you want to keep in mind if you're trying to build out your digital portfolio, um, people talk about GitHub and talk about, um, um, you know, push and pulls and so forth. The other thing you may want to look at is maybe some of the features within GitHub and see how you can use those to augment what you're doing. Um, I think GitHub has been doing a decent job, um, an interesting job in trying to come up with a couple of things uh, extra for people. Um, two of them of which I think are, are pretty straightforward are just, um, and I'll talk about that in a second, and then also, which is in a beta, is projects. Um, just, if, and I'm pretty sure you've probably seen this before, um, just are very useful uh, scripts that you can write or you can transfer code to. And then you can take those and embed the link into either a blog post um, or an article post or embed into a social media post. And the idea is, is that um, if you need to go back and make a correction at something, um, let's say that you have, a, or maybe, maybe an update, maybe there's a, a dependency that that is much better than the um, one that you originally wrote for, or you want to use the new pipe, for example, rather than um, uh, indicating the old way for getting a pipe in R. You can make the update in GIST and will automatically update in whatever the embed is. So it will show in the embed. Um, I use GIST quite a bit for Medium. And that's helped me to kind of get articles out and get things out uh, within some reasonable um, time. And then Another option um, separate from this is GitHub projects. And this is on the right hand, this is what you see on the right hand side. And I use this, um, I've started to use this to help me um, take steps um, and kind of mark down what I'm doing a little bit alongside maybe a, um, a it's, you can, it, it shows within a repository. So you can do use this alongside your projects if you have things that you know that you have several steps on. Uh, for example, I'm actually finally getting Python put on my Mac, and I'm noticing that I can't use Miniconda on my uh, MacBook Pro for some reason. So I've been marking down and putting down the process a little bit. Um, that helps me a little bit because when I circle back to try to pick up where I left off and see and, and explain um, um, to myself what I've done. And this can also help me down the line if I'm actually getting ready to see and explain steps uh, uh, to people who I write articles on or, or share things on on social media. Um, and you can, they're cards. So you, so just like in Notion, you can move the cards around, you can label, and you can put them in, in a uh, numeric order. Um, another thing you can do, another source of ideas is um, when you're using IDEs or notebooks is thinking about your workflow and thinking about what those experiences are. If there's features or updates that can help you. Uh, this is uh, our studio, for example. Um, one of the things that you can do at our studio now that's brand new is you can actually add a source a column uh, additionally in the, um, or more than one source column, you add two or three if you want, um, within its standard four pane window. And the advantage of this is giving you, a, giving you a way of comparing one set of, um, of uh, scripts against each other. You can do debugging, you can do, double, you can do a double check of um, how things compare. Um, but the point of this is that I learned about this by, by sticking with the ecosystem around that IDE. And what I mean by this is that, you know, you treat your notebooks, whether it's a, a notebook, maybe say a Jupyter notebook, um, or uh, maybe an IDE where there's a number of extensions of you treat it as an ecosystem, that can help you in terms of, under, of keep, not only keeping track of what changes are out there, but what changes may be of interest for you and maybe some ideas of what you would like to share relative to, you, to uh, um, your projects and what you're doing. And then one of the things you can also do is use uh, social media um, to connect uh, to the community. I mentioned a little bit about Twitter um, quite a bit. Uh, I've used dashboards, Hootsuite, and TweetDeck um, to follow along with a particular hashtag. So if I want to follow our stats, for example, um, again, I can have a column dedicated to our stats that will show every tweet that uses that hashtag. The advantage of this is that now I have a way of searching and identifying and looking for a community thread and seeing if there's some sort of responses that are going on. So this is a great way of, of um, uh, 
you know, just fi following a community, um, giving you a chance to um, not get so much into searching on within the uh, main app for Twitter or main app for, for Instagram, which also can be used in these, uh, in the Hootsuite dashboard at least. Um, it gives you a chance to break them into streams and be able to kind of follow along a little bit more easily. Um, a lot of times when I'm looking at things, I'm from my perspective, I usually look for things that maybe are sometimes that deals with digital marketing. So I deal with SEO, uh, digital ads, a little bit with social media, but I'm also looking at things that deals with our programming, um, regressions, machine learning, um, with data, with data science, and 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 so forth. Let's see how we're doing on time. I'm not doing too bad. Okay, um, so we got a couple of slides here. So maybe I'm, gonna try, I'm trying to keep us towards the uh, at the 45 minute mark. It may go a little long here, but just slightly. Um, so the other thing you want to do is. Um, you know, in the meantime, uh, a lot of times people, they throw a LinkedIn profile, but they really don't do a whole lot with a profile um, uh, beyond just saying, hey, I got a profile, and they don't really check it regularly. I think you need to check it regularly. And regularly to me means that if, if not at least once a week, um, you know, I'm on my, I keep a tab open on LinkedIn every day as much and as well as Twitter and as Facebook because I have clients across uh, three sets that I have to talk to. But the idea with this is that you want to be responsive and network with people. Remember I said, allies are not always in the room with you. So LinkedIn um, makes it easier to have those allies nearby, people who um, can write recommendations for you, people who can revert, refer to you for jobs or for uh, opportunities or for grants, for example. Um, and then also you can also profile um, either papers or updates and articles. You can feature that on your profile. But the tip to this is, uh, the thing I always tell people is do not just sit and let that be something stagnant for months and months on end. That's not, that's that defeats the whole purpose of networking, basically. So now with all this together, um, so we talked a little bit about content. We talked a little bit about um um, a little bit about uh, uh, different services or things you can use, and we talked, and we're kind of we're talking a little bit more about social media now. Um, so now we're going to talk, get more into building the community with care, um, and by care I mean that you know it's about sticking through on your topic and talking about it. Um, you know, it, it, building a community means attracting the people who will notice and share your work, for example. Um, and it, that could be a number of different ways. It could be, um, you know. Again, conferences have moved online over the last year or two because of COVID. Um, but just because they have a date that says, hey, we're going to have a conference doesn't mean that they stop talking or dealing with, with, each, with uh, people throughout the year. So again, using your dashboards, using um, um, you know, LinkedIn periodically, you can help and stay in tune and help talk and network with people who, who will notice and share your work the most. Um, and make your interactions a little bit more than a hello. You can ask people directly how you're doing, what's going on. Um, I actually use the DMs, um, direct messaging and IMs. I actually look at the dates if, I, if, I, if it's possible or, or the last time I spoke to somebody. Like if you're in Facebook, you can actually see and, and look and there's usually a dub, a, a, um, in the IMs you can see in Google Mess, in Facebook Messenger, you can see a uh, two week, three week, how many days. Uh, that tells me a little bit about when was the last time that we spoke to each other. Um, it helps keeps me honest a little bit in terms of talking with people. And, you know, and the other thing you want to do is also support people's presentations with your presence when you can and where it's possible. Um, so that's something that, 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 that can be, a, again, a way to build your community and let people know that you're around. Um, quick word on Zoom and Slack. This falls under the um, work behind the scenes sort of thing. Um, keep the same professional demeanor as you would in person. Um, again, it, these are, are the people who use, anytime that people have used uh, Zoom, Slack, any sort of um, AirMeet, any sort of a uh, platform, uh, frankly, likely they're going to follow you on Twitter or, or Instagram, depending upon the community that you're in. Um, People will follow you, but a lot of times they will look you up. And some people will also look you up on LinkedIn quite a bit. But most times, I've had more people on Twitter than anything else. Um, but the point of this is that you want to um, use these as a way of checking in with people. And again, this is um, uh, this is a desktop version of Slack that you're looking at right here. And it's very similar to Hootsuite. Um, you can have different communities and different threads that you can go back and look at um, to... Um, 
uh, so that we can re re uh, refer and talk to people clearly. So now, as you're talking to people, there are some things you want to keep in mind um, uh, that will help on your professionalism online. Um, keeping your communication on the tech topics as straight as possible. Um, keep your ear open for device changes. Uh, we talk a lot about um, platforms. We talk a lot about online solutions. But even devices uh, and, and discussions or articles written on it uh, can be in, um, a little bit of an insight as well, too. Um, a really good one, Apple, uh, ever since they've come out with the M1, um, I've noticed a few articles that talk a little bit about uh, frameworks that did not update or, or having a hard time uh, operating on the new chip. Um, I know, I guess I mentioned about Miniconda earlier, and I, I'm still finding that there's, uh, while I was able to run Python, um, I wasn't able to run Miniconda. And that the significance of that to me is that now that impacts um, how I can do a virtual um uh, run um, Python virtually uh, um, and, and connect it with uh, R Studio. It kind of changes a few things a little bit. But my point is, is that keeping up with the devices a little bit can help you uh, understand and keep attuned to updates a little bit. It kind of helps guides you a little bit in terms of uh, uh, what to follow, what maybe to talk about or even um, engage with. Um, and the same token, outdated technology uh, doesn't mean that the conversation ends. Um, sometimes things that are outdated has, has a tendency to come back. The best example I can give you are QR codes. Um, those were introduced like right just before I started my company and probably about, I think it was 2012, if I remember correctly, eMarketer did a study that showed that people, consumers were not getting into uh, QR codes. Um, QR codes, for those of you who don't, who don't know what they look like, uh, they are those squares that you see on the store. Um, kind of like a, it's literally a barcode with different sort of uh, square technology behind it. And the idea is, is that you scan it for information. Back in 2019, 2012, um, it, it didn't take off as much as marketers hoped. And the problem was that people were looking for discounts. Uh, they were looking for things that were helping benefiting them, but marketers were too busy pushing out um, information through those QR codes. Fast forward to COVID. Um, QR codes came back in a big way because it's a touchless technology. Um, to scan it, you have to actually use an app within the smartphone. So back in 2009, it seemed a little bit out, you know, it was on 2009, 2000, uh, 2012, it looked like it was going to be outdated, but today, not so much so. Um, and then lastly, uh, just, you know, in your communication, look at your tech discussions and, and, and just make sure they complement um, your, your interest. Um, a lot of times you hear discussions about imposter syndrome and people being overwhelmed. I think part of the challenge is that it's, it's easy to get into the weeds a little bit. And I think what you want to do is to really take a step back and, and figure out how to, um, you know, find, whether it's finding examples of, that relate to what you're interested in, you know, Sometimes that gives you ideas of how to express or explain something much better. So that becomes much more important. Um, when you're online, um, you know, now don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that you have to have your shirt and tie or your uh, professional blouse on every time you're on screen. Um, but you want, you want to be a little careful about casual communication, even if it's on a separate platform. Um, I, I can't tell you how many times that I've, I've there's people I've literally blocked or dropped because they may have looked great on LinkedIn, but on, face, on Facebook, it was radically weirdly different. Um, so you have to be careful. Um, I would say the, the key things to keep in mind, uh, snarky can be fun, but be careful. Not everybody reads snarky the same way. Um, it, putting that into a tweet or a post, uh, sometimes that could be misinterpreted as being uh, maybe uh, too troll-like, basically. We'll get to trolls here in a moment. Um, try to control the laments and rants um, and, and try to watch people who are <laughs> lamenting and ranting a little too much. Um, it's okay to have moments. I don't think that's a bad thing, but you want to manage your time. And I think if you are, um, particularly if you are, if it's a business or kind of consultation that you started or launched, you want to be careful about um, being so casual that it looks like you're not doing anything ever. Uh, that's not that's not a great image to give, particularly if you're starting out. You want to be show that you're reliable. You want to show that you're on you know on top or near top of it. And and the best way is kind of staying focused. Um, and then I would say be careful with memes. Um, sometimes memes have a tendency to 
while they make comparisons, sometimes they make false comparisons that that pit um, particularly social groups against each other. Um, you don't want you, you want to be very careful with that because sometimes that that implies that you have a people start questioning is that something you believe in or that's something that you are are advocating for. Um, um, you see this quite a bit with uh, particularly talk about uh, people of color. Um, you know there are there are some issues that are dedicated to the black community, but there are also some issues that also impact um, other groups as well too. And sometimes it's about for politics, it's about coalition. And you want to be able to show that as a professional that you're savvy about those discussions, not uh, unsavvy. So be so I would say be careful with memes sometimes. Okay, we're at six forty eight. I got two more slides. I, mean, I know we're running a little late, but we will get this done. Um, Keeping trolls away. Let me let me talk about this real quickly. Um, it, trolling is a is a fact of life, unfortunately, online. But there are some things you can do to kind of minimize it. Um, you, you know, again, if you see somebody uh, trolling, a lot of times they have their profiles look like they ramble, they go on about stuff. Just like I said, you know, going on rants and so forth. Those are people that you stay away. Feel welcome to block. Um, and sometimes trolls are often automated messages in, a, in, a, in the DM. Sometimes I've gotten people saying, hey, I love to do a website. And I can almost tell that it's pretty much an um, automated message. Um, I'm very slow to respond to those. I don't get angry. Don't get upset. Um, I just try to ask some very specific questions to see if the person has done their homework. If they're being very general, chances are it's a troll. Um, when I talk to people in uh, messaging, I, I usually can ask or talk to them with personal detail. Um, I do this for a practical reason is because I want to let someone that let my network know that it's me and not a bot. And I think that's helpful to let people know that um, you are managing your social media. And it's also a way of, of uh, letting them know that um, uh, when you request something that it's a real request and they don't see you as being a troll. That's kind of one of the problems with social media. It's always a, 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 a a mirror thing basically in terms of uh, how people can, it's not only just how you interpret them, it's how they can interpret you. Um, and then I do a little exercise where I check my uh, Instagram followers, Twitter followers, and I clear out a few people who I think are, are trolling. Um, when I first started, it was anything, the adult thing that was cleared out very quickly, but now I think Bitcoin, um, I got nothing against Bitcoin and cyber uh, um, currency, but on Instagram in particular, I've had, when I started using um, Clubhouse, I started noticing I was getting more and more Bitcoin uh, brokers. And I blocked those quite a bit. Um, you, you just you just want your followers to, you want to be able, you don't need to go through everything. Um, if you have 5,000 followers, thousands of followers, I think that's a lot of labor. But what you want to do is just, you know, check once in a while, do a little spot check and just make sure that you're connecting with people. Say hi, use that as an opportunity to say hello to the people you like. Um, Real quick on um, har uh, harassment, um, avoiding harassment, and we're going to talk about mental health here before we wrap up. Um, so on top of trolling, harassment can also be a big deal. And harassment is about making repeated comments towards people. Um, and, and so what you want to do is, again, look, you know, make sure that if people are trying to harass, look at how they're doubling down in a thread. Um, sometimes, you know, profiles are hacked. I can tell you off the bat, there was an organization that got hacked by... Um, someone who uh, they were putting out because he was he or she was upset and he got into a main account and they started hacking um, and making all sorts of uh, vile comments. The good news is people uh, people responded. They were able to kind of see through that and they were able to respond. So one of the things you want to keep in mind about community is is that having a community can help you when there's a when there's a crisis like this. Um, screenshot the conversation. Um, sometimes there may be some legal issues that may come into it. A lot of people don't realize this, but social media is not protected speech. So what you want to do is, um, you know, if you, if it's, go if it's ongoing, screenshot that son of a boy for real, um, block all people, um, on all platforms. Um, if you're getting harassed on Twitter, if they're, if you know, they're on Instagram and LinkedIn, block that, block that mess. I was about to curse there for a second, but block, <laughs> but block that mess. And if there's somebody that is from a community that where you had an email address, you may want to consider the idea of, of uh, blocking the email address as well, too. You can do that, basically. Um, again, you just um, want to be able to prevent, uh, protect yourself and protect others around you. And then finally, um, if, if um, you know, the big thing I would say is don't circumvent someone uh, blocking you. Um if you need, I'll say this from personal experience. I had someone block me 
but it was accidental. Uh, they had thought that I was mixed in with somebody else who was harassing them a little bit. Um, found out through a little bird that I got mixed in with that. And what I did was I actually got their email, um, went to their website, got their email. I directly wrote to the email said, and all I did was say, hey, I am sorry. I didn't, I, you know, you may have saw that my um, uh, blog, my post was mixed in with somebody else. I didn't see it and didn't realize that maybe my message did look a little, little uh, suspect and I don't blame you, but I am sorry. And that person unblocked me. Um, so um, she used to, but, but the backside of that is you should never circumvent someone blocking you. You shouldn't be going to people's family or anything else like that. If you do that, um, in some states, that's actually considered harassment. So you do, again, do, if someone blocks you, unless you want to make a, a clear apology for something, contact, make the apology. But otherwise, I would not, if you can't do that or if it's just messed up, let it be and, and roll on. Um, real quick mental health notes here. How we do, ooh, okay, getting up on the hour here. So I'm trying to wrap up here. I, I thank you for being patient. Um, addressing the mental health. Um, you know, there's things that you can do that, that um, uh, to keep, it, you know, keep your community together. Uh, step up encouraging people if they're struggling with a job loss or if their divorces are announced. Um, job loss, divorce, those are the two big triggers for uh, uh, mental health and de uh, for depression. So even if people aren't saying it, just, you know, you can step up and say, hey, and ask them how they're doing. Uh, sometimes subtle, sim subtle, simple responses are enough. You don't need to, to boil the ocean and give, give a long, long speech about it. Um, I had one guy who was lamenting a little bit on my Facebook, my personal Facebook. And what I did was I went back to my contacts, found uh, jobs in, in his area, just gave it to him, say, hey, just happened to notice this. Take a look, see if this helped. And I think it, it, I think it did help him. We never did talk about it at length, but I think it did help him. But the point is, is that instead of trying to give some sort of cheery message um, that is empty, I tried to see what I could do to, to give something that might might give some help or relief or response. Um, and that goes to my next point. Give people the choice of either wanting to explain or talking about it or keeping it to themselves. Um, and use time in following up with people to see if, uh, if he, she, or they are okay. Um, sometimes, you know, giving a break and then if you find in a couple of days you want to follow up with them, follow up with them. And also um, for yourself, give yourself a break. Uh, vary your laptop usage. Um, I mentioned about different types of media. Um, again, you know, giving yourself breaks, doing the same thing o over several hours, that's not the new get. You want to be able to give yourself maybe small breaks in there as well. So let's, so let's, let's wrap up a lot of this. So I know I've covered quite a bit. Um, if you're trying to put together, um, you know, what is it, you know, content ideas, you know, trying to be professional online, um, gather uh, notes and use IDE notebooks, uh, whiteboards and the note apps. Evernote, I think I'm going to say this again, it's, it's, it's the bomb, but there are other ones out there as well too, like Notion and so forth and, um, and OneNote. But gather your notes together. Um, identify your media and content and, and, and use dictation to get some ideas out um, and develop some good search in your note app so that way you can put ideas together quickly and, and, and work on developing them. Um, be active in sharing what you learned and why and Aim for about three, as a starting point, aim, see if you can, can put it together in three sentences or so, roughly. Just something that's short that gives you sort of a starting point. And you can always expand it out if you want, want to make it into a course or some sort of longer piece of content. Um, leverage a lot of different types of features are out there. Leverage your GitHub features. Um, leverage um, features within your IDE or notebook um, as an ecosystem, again, for top, not only for topics, but also for managing your projects. And then also um, identify where your community is online. Um, you can do that via, through social media dashboards. And then most of all, be consistent online and offline. Um, doing that gives people a real good sense of who you are. And that, I promise you, if, if you're working independently, that will, that will translate into real customers. That will translate into opportunities that you would never dream that you've had before. So with that, I'm going to say Thank you. And I'm going to see if there's any questions. Um, I hope I have not missed anything here. Thank you so much, Pierre. Really, really appreciate the very comprehensive <laughs> uh, <laughs> offerings. I don't think I was expecting all. Actually, I definitely was not expecting all of this, but I certainly do appreciate it. Um, 
Let's see, I was looking in the chat to see if there are any notes and you did not miss any probably because you were so comprehensive and complete. Um, does anyone have any questions for Pierre? Or of course you can, he has his uh, contact information. So uh, feel free to reach out to him. We have Twitter, um, Instagram. Was there something at the bottom? Oh, yes. Um, it's a little bit cut off from me. Sorry about that. Um, can you see it now? Is yes, it, okay. get so, in. yes. Yeah, so I, I probably, probably the easiest thing is remember Zamana Analytics, that's my company. Uh, <laughs> so, um, but uh, but um, mostly I'm on Twitter and Instagram, LinkedIn. Um, feel welcome to connect, um, ask a question or two, uh, and, and I want to see you succeed. So, so feel welcome, really feel welcome.